Okay, today we're going to be learning Psachim Daf Ayin Tet. Um, today's Daf is sponsored by uh, Elisheba Gray, a memory of a dear teacher and friend, Yoa Melech Ben Moshe Basara Zechronol Levacha. His passion and fervor for Judaism and Jewish learning has been and continues to be an inspiration for me. And also by Regina Raphael, a memory of her mother, Rose B. Raphael, and her second year at site. She was an advocate of women's learning and independence. Rose was, the fir- Rose was the first in her family to attend college and had a career in television before starting a family. She always maintained a professional career until her passing, uh, starting a career in real estate even in her, in her 60s. Okay, we're going to start from um, the very top of the page. I intend. So what we learned yesterday, just to review, we were talking about the Mishnah where, what if, nitma basar v'chelev kayam, either the meat of the Korban Pesach becomes impure, but the chelev is still there. If that's the case, if the meat is impure and the parts that we that we put on the altar are still there, it doesn't matter. That was a unique law to Pesach because the food, the eating of the meat is very important. But if it's the reverse and you still have the meat, even if you don't have the parts that go on the altar, you can zorek et adam. To which Rav said, by the way, this is only lechatchila, meaning, right, when you're going to do this, and if that happens and you know, don't sprinkle the blood. But in the case where you didn't realize or you did it anyway, im zara kortza, if you did it, it's valid. It's done. What's done is done. He says it's okay. We tried to figure out how could he possibly say that? Isn't the eating very important? And basically, shouldn't it prevent you from being able to bring this sacrifice properly? To which we said, he must hold like Rabbi Natan. Then the Gemara said, where do we have Rabbi Natan? They tried to figure out where did Rabbi Natan say this? We found some source where he didn't exactly say this explicitly. He was talking about the Minuyim, if you do it for two different groups, even though there's not enough meat for everybody. And he says it actually works. And that seems to show the, it's that Bidiyevet, it's okay. And that's because of his language. He said, specifically, um, the language was, let me just find it. Rishonim, and ochlim, Rabbi Natan says, Elu ve'elu, p'turim ilasot Pesach sheni, shekfar nizra kadam. Because the blood was already sprinkled. So even if there wasn't enough meat for everybody, you seem to see there, achila loma'ach. Now the Gemara, and then we had a whole thing. We brought some bright toad, whose opinion does this match? And then there was a debate about the last one. Anyway, now we're going to go into a second answer to explain Rav, uh, Rav, that he wasn't that he held like Rabbi Natan, he held like Rabbi Yoshua. Ibait Ema, Rav de Amar ke Rabbi Yoshua, de Tanya. As it says in the following Braita, this is going to be a little more explicit, like really exactly what Rav says. So you wonder why they didn't bring this before. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they didn't know about this brayta until someone brought it. Rabbi Yoshua Omer, kol azvachim shebatorah. When it comes to all sacrifices, meaning other than Pesach, and we'll see maybe another one. Ben shenitma basar v'chelav kayam. Ben shenitma chelav u'basar kayam. We saw this already in our mission. It doesn't matter as long as one of them is still a pro, is still a, a pure. Then zorek et adam. You need either the parts that go on the altar or the meat to be pure. As long as one of them is, it doesn't matter which one, you can you do the blood on the altar. But Nazir, but Osa Pesach, hold off on the Nazir, we'll get to him in a minute. But let's just focus on the Osa Pesach. Nitma chelev ubasal kayam zorek et adam. Only if it's the chelev that became impure. But if it's, as long as the meat is still intact and in good shape, then you're fine. But nitma basar v'chelev kayam en zorek et adam. Okay, that's our Mishnah. But now, im zara kortza, here you see it explicitly. But if you did it anyway, it's effective, okay? This works. There you have exactly what Rav tried to read into our Mishnah. Here's one last case, which doesn't, isn't, isn't relevant right now for our purposes, but it's another interesting case that they bring in this Braita with Rabbi Yoshua. Nitzmu habalim b'met, if the owners became tame mate, right? They became impure to a dead person. That's an exception. If the meat became impure, if you already did it, it's okay, according to Rabbi Yoshua. But if the people became to me'me'et, that doesn't work. Okay, moving on. Okay, now we're at the last line of the Mishnah where it said it's not the same for, oh, I forgot to talk about the Nazir, sorry. Go back to the Nazir. The Nazir, what's with the Nazir? Where Why all of a sudden do we bring in the Nazir? We haven't been talking about the Nazir until now. Right? Every time we talk about the food is, is so critical, it's only in the carbon Pesach, not anywhere else. So where does the Nazir come in? So Rashi says, it must be, he says, really the Nazir, Rashi says in the second line of Rashi, 
they're also meant for eating the sacrifices of the Nazir. How so? Nazir brings three sacrifices. He shaves his hair. He burns his hair with the pot. One of the sacrifices he brings is a shlamim. Shlamim get eaten. So we're talking about the shlamim because the other ones don't get eaten. What happens? He boils up a pot. He puts his hair on after he shaves off his hair. His hair, because remember, the Nazir can't cut his hair. When he goes to finish Nizi root, he cuts his hair. He puts, he shaves it all off. He puts it on the fire. And what fire? The fire that's cooking up the shlamim. So comes Rashi, he says, that is such an important part. That must be ma'akev. Okay? And that's why the food is significant. If he doesn't have meat to boil up, he's not going to be able to put the hair on the fire where the meat is cooking. So therefore it's critical. To which Tosfa responds and says, what? That's ma'akev? In the whole process of the Nazir, you think that that's going to prevent the Nazir from being able to do a sacrifice if he can't burn the hair? It's not a critical element of the whole process. So Tosfas actually says, Riva Omer, the first Tosfat on the page, the Riva says, Dilo garas Nazir. He says, basically, take that word out. That shouldn't be here. There's actually, I believe this is in the Tosefta. I think so. Well, maybe not. No, it's not maybe. But anyway, it could be. I'm not sure. I thought I saw it was in the Tosefta. But in any case, he says, take the version out. I didn't have a chance to check if it actually appears there or not. I think it, I saw a note that maybe it doesn't. But anyway, there's obviously a Girsa question here about whether the word Nazir is there or not. Okay. Oh, the, 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 oh that's where it is. Yeah. Okay. So thank you for pointing that out. Right. So they say, Ube Tosefta lo garas Nazir, the last line of Tosfot says it. I knew I saw it somewhere. So to, it says in the end of Tosfot that in the Tosefta, it doesn't appear. I didn't check. It's always good to check those things and see. Again, you won't necessarily prove anything. What it means is the Tosos Girsa of the Tosefta didn't have it, right? I don't know what Girsa we have. Um, in any case, it's an interesting question here about whether the Nazir belongs here or doesn't belong here. The bigger question would be if the Nazir doesn't belong here, right? It's actually, when you come to checking girsas and things, this would be a, a criteria you would use, which is it makes more sense that you wouldn't have Nazir here, right? Based on everything we learned, which would say that if there is a Nusak that says Nazir, how on earth would that have happened? Which proves maybe, or at least gives strength to the side that maybe Nazir really is there because otherwise who on earth would have added Nazir here if it really didn't belong there, right? Nusra'ot, Girsa'ot often get changed because whoever's copying them thinks that there's a mistake. So it's more likely they would take out Nazir rather than add it in. So that's just a, it's just a theory. Um, it's not necessarily always true, but it's sometimes a way to think about when you have different Nusra'ot, you have to think about different Girsa's. Why, why would someone make that mistake, right? Usually the mistake is made because somebody thinks, oh, it's a mistake, they took it out. So, or, or they added something in, but here, why would someone think to add Nazir in if it really didn't belong here? Okay, moving on. So now we're at the last line of the Mishnah, which says that all other korbanot, all you need is either the basar or the chelev. I'm going to go back to something we talked about before with the shteachilot of the shlamim, how the consumption, okay, well, if we use the word consumption to consume, there's two, consumption could be by eating, consumption could be by burning. And again, what happens to the meat is we have two different consumptions going on. What we're going to see here is they're really kind of one package. And that, that, that's why if one of them is there, that's sufficient because some part of it needs to be consumed after the, the sprinkling of the blood or the throwing of the blood, whatever it might be in, either, in whatever case, but something has to be consumed, either consumed on the altar or maybe consumed by eating. So therefore, if you have one or the other, that's fine. And then you can do the blood, but you do need one or the other. So now we're going to say, Maniti, Mani, who does our Mishnah follow? Rabbi Yoshua, which is interesting because we just said that Rav, who limits the Mishnah, is also according to Rabbi Yoshua. And now we're going to see that the other rest of the Mishnah is also Rabbi Yoshua, the Tanya. Rabbi Yoshua Omer, Kol Azvachim Sheva Torah, Shen Shteir Mehem Kezayet Basar, O Kezayet Chelev, Zoreket Adam. Okay, so again, what does he say? This matches the Mishnah. You need either a Kezayet of the Chelev, of the part you burn, or a Kezayet of the meat. What if we're going to have, in Rabbi Yoshua's opinion, some other options? Well, if these are really one and the same, then what if you had half an olive bulk and half an olive bulk of each? Can we combine them? Can we say, oh, look, all together, we have a consumption of an olive bulk. It's just that one goes on the altar and one is, gets eaten. Well, he says, no, this isn't going to work. Why is this not going to work? Because in order for it to work, you need a kazayat of one thing. These don't combine entirely. Okay, yes, they, they combine to the sense each one's a consumption, but you need 
a full consumption. You can't have half a consumption and half, a, half and half don't always make up a whole, basically. Ube ola, right? Especially when you're mixing apples and oranges, right? They're similar, but they're still not exactly the same. Ube ola, however, there's one exception to the rule. In a korban ola, where everything gets burnt, including the chelev and including the meat. Everything goes on the altar, nothing gets eaten. In that case, that's why, because since the whole thing gets burnt, we can basically say half a kazayat of that, half a kazayat. It doesn't matter that normally that's in one category and that's in another category. They're all going together, right? Like all the apples and oranges are going together so we can mix them and say, okay, half and half is, will work. In a mincha offering, even if the whole mincha is there, you still can't throw the blood. So now the Gemara says, Mincha, Maya Vidata, what are you talking about a Mincha here? What blood is there in a Korba Mincha? A Korba Mincha is a meal offering. It's, remember, you have the Kmitza, you take a little bit out, you burn it, the rest gets eaten. There is no blood. What blood are you talking about? So Amar of Papa, and, and in order to understand what that line is talking about entirely, you have to understand what are we talking about. So, so you know, the fact that you didn't understand that line, don't worry. The Gemara doesn't understand it either. So Rav Papa explains, Mincha Nisachim. What's a minchat nisachim? Do you know we say this in our davening and on the holidays or Shabbat minchatam v'niskehem ki medubal, right? We bring the minachot and the nisachim alongside these sacrifices, as it says, shlosha sronim lapal, shnei sronim laayil, etc. These are, okay, if you've ever thought about what this means, these are things that go along with sacrifices. A mincha offering is something you can bring on your own, okay, just a mincha offering, or, you know, certain times you have to bring a mincha offering like a mincha to Omer and things like that. But sometimes they were brought as accessories to sacrifices. So with your korban, you brought on the holiday, let's say you brought, there were wine libations, oil libations, and mincha offerings. So now the question is, what if we said, if you have your animal and your animal becomes impure and the meat becomes impure and the chela becomes impure, you can't do the blood. What if all that became problematic, but you still had the mincha that went with that sacrifice? Would that be considered something significant that you still have part of the korban left and therefore be allowed to do the blood? So that's what it's saying here. So you might have thought, since it comes from the sacrifice, you are only bringing this mincha because you're bringing a sacrifice. Maybe it's like the sacrifice itself. Therefore, it comes to teach you this is not the case. Okay? The fact that your mincha is left. That's an accessory. It's a side thing. It's not part of the sacrifice itself, even though it, it goes with the sacrifice. And therefore, if the meat's impure, the chelev is impure, and all you have left is the mincha, even if it's, and now let's go back to the words, even if your entire mincha is perfect, nothing happened to it. It's all pure and it's all there. No, you still can't bring your sacrifice. You can't sprinkle the blood. Now we're going to go back and explain chelev minalan. How do we know that you could bring the chelev even if there's no meat left, okay? That it's enough to, you could sprinkle the blood if there's chelev left. So how do we get this? He learned it from Rabbi Yishmael. Some say he brought it in the name of Rabbi Yishmael and Hananiah. These are Tanaim, and as Rabbi Yochanan Amora brought it in the name of other Tanaim. The Pasuk says, Okay, it says, and you burn the chelev for reach nichoach. So they say here it says specifically you burn the chelev and it doesn't talk about the meat. So it sounds like just chelev alone will be enough. So eshkechan chelev, fine. I get it then about chelev. But all this time we said the chelev is really a reference to the imurim, which are there's other parts you burn on the altar. There's the diaphragm and there's the two kidneys. So now they say, what about I get it. If the chelev is still left and you have a kazayat of it that didn't become impure, you're good. You can sprinkle the blood. But what about, we have a verse because it says, okay, which means we burn the chelev as a, a pleasant smell to God. How do we know if let's say the chelev is impure, but we do have the diaphragm and the two kidneys, which are the other parts that get burnt. How do we know that that, then we can still go ahead with the blood. So first of all, the Gemara stops for a minute before we even ask where do we get it from? Okay, Minale, where do we Minale, where do we learn it from? They say 
How do we even know that that's true? Our Misha didn't say it was true. Our Misha said chalef. Our Misha didn't say yoteret hakaved and the sheach layot. So they say we can get it from the fact that it says mita katane ubemincha afa pisha kula kiamat lo yizrok. In the words of Rabbi Yoshua and the Brayta, he said, "Well, if it's the mincha's left, it doesn't work." You can infer mincha hu delo aval yoteret hakaved u sheach layot shapir dami. So. The side question we answer, which is, how do we even know that it's true that you can? We derive it from the fact that the mincha. If the mincha is entirely intact, it doesn't allow you to sprinkle the blood. But that means anything that is part of the sacrifice itself, which would be the animal itself, which would be the yotera da kaved and the klayot, then obviously you can still go ahead with the blood. So now, minal, and now we go back to our original question. Now that we, let's remember, we started with the question, where do we know that these items can that you can do the blood if they're still okay, even if let's say the chalev and the meat are impure, which it sounded from the Mishnah, just the chalev and the meat and not the, these other two things. But they now proved, we can infer from the mincha line that that would be included. So now they wanna go back to the original question, which is manala, where do we derive those from? So Rabbi Yochanan Didei, the same Rabbi Yochanan who brought the drasha about the chalev also gives an answer to this. He says, Amal kal reach nichach. Because it says for a pleasant smell, therefore a pleasant aroma, therefore we can say anything for a pleasant aroma, meaning including other things that we put on the altar, okay, which would be the Otera da Kaved and the Kleot. So we get it from there. So now the obvious question is why did you need Chelev and the Otera da Kaved and the, you know, and the Rech Nichoch to include those? Why wouldn't one just have covered them all? You need to write both. Why? Therefore, if you just had chalev, you would have assumed just chalev, like we just did a minute ago. Therefore, you need a reach nichach. That's obvious. But why wouldn't you just have reach nichach? And then that would include the chalev and all of them, and then you wouldn't need it. Uh, if you had said just Rechnichach, you would have thought maybe also the Mincha, because that also goes on the altar and has uh, an aroma. So they say, therefore, Katavachman Chelev. Chelev was said to tell you specifically, I guess they didn't want to write the whole word, Chelev, Yotera Kaved, and Kleyot. So they basically said Chelev, which includes that, and that includes it. The Rechnichach comes to make sure that you know that's included, but it, it excludes, the chalef excludes the mincha. Okay, new Mishnah. Now we're getting into Tuma Hutra B'tzibor, the famous that we've been talking about, but now we're gonna attack it head on, which is in which cases can you bring the Pesach even if you're Tumayin, okay? When is it allowed? What are the parameters? And we're gonna get to the classic Israeli uh, Gemara question of what if it's 50-50, okay? We love those kind of questions, right? Majority, yes, right. Now there's two issues. Number one is if the majority are Tme'im, then you bring it on Pesach Rishon. If the majority are Tme'im, you can't bring it on Pesach Sheni. So what are we going to do if it's 50-50? You know, on the one hand, can we allow you to do Pesach Rishon? And if we don't, can you do Pesach Sheni? Because Pesach Sheni, you need to have a minority Tme'im. It has to be ish ish. Remember it said by Pesach Sheni, individuals only. So how's it going to work? I'll already tell you there's going to be two opinions, which are going to branch out into three, because there's going to be two. There's going to be Rav and Rav Kahana are going to debate this issue. And then within Rav Kahana, there's two versions of what he says. So the Mishnah starts out, Nitzmah Kahal Orubo, if the community becomes impure or the majority of the community, in other words, either everybody or the majority, then Oshayu Koanim Tmeim Vakahal Torim, or the majority of the Koanim. We've mentioned this many times. Now we see it head on, right? It's either the community or the Kohanim, the majority of them, even if the Kahal is Tehorim, okay, the people are Tehor, Yasu Betuma, we bring it Betuma. What does it mean we bring it Betuma? It means we don't care anymore about Tuma and the Mikdash, okay? You can use, Tame people can come, anything. Tuma Hutra Betzibor. Nitma Mi Uta Kahal. What if a minority of the community was Tameim? So then what do we do? So this is obvious. Hatehorim Osim Etarishon, Batmeim Osim Etashini. So anyone who is impure gets pushed off to Pesach Sheni. So only the pure people come to the temple. Because what this means is, if let's say I'm an individual, I'm Tmea, okay? I, I, have, I went to a funeral just before Pesach. Then the majority of the people are fine. But the Kohanim, the majority of the Kohanim are Tmeim. 
So what happens? I'm going back to the first line of the Mishnah. We do the Pesach Bituma, and I could come to the temple, even though normally, if the Kohanim wouldn't have been majority to me, I would have been pushed off to Pesach Sheni. But in this case, since Tuma was overridden, I can go to the temple. And likewise, if you say the people, the majority are to me, but the Kohanim, you know, let's say a, major, uh, a majority of the Kohanim are actually Tohrim, do you tell the Kohanim or it's me, listen, you do Pesach Sheni and don't come work in the temple? So the answer is no, we don't. We let everyone come to the temple and do the work. It doesn't matter because this is a year where Pesach Utra. Okay, we're going to see soon that sometimes there might be differences. Tano Rabbanan. So now we bring a brighter, which basically says similar to our Mishnah, but it breaks it up and I charted it out so you can see it a little bit visually um, at the bottom of the first page. They're adding an extra element, which is what if all the utensils in the temple were tohim, okay, or tmeim? We're going to get to. So there's there's the Israel, there's the Kohanim. Those were the two factors mentioned in the Mishnah. Now we're adding another factor, which is all the utensils become tamei. So the first case is only that the Yisraelim were tamei, everyone non Kohanim, and again just majority, and the Kohanim and the Klei Sharet and all the utensils were fine, then, or, then we're going to say Pesach Utra, right? Oh, Shayu Yisrael Tehorim, or the Yisrael was Tehorim, but the Kohanim and the Klei Sharet were Tmeim, or the Kohanim and the utensils in the temple were all impure. Afilu, or even Yisrael the Kohanim Tehorim, maybe all the people are Tahor, but Klei Sharet Tmeim, if just the utensils were Tmeim, Ya Subatuma, everything gets done, meaning Everyone who's Tamei can come in that year. Okay, this is fascinating. And we're going to discuss, this might not be in every case. Okay, it's going to depend on how they were Tamei. She'en korban sibor chaluk. This is a very big line. This means because we don't start doing a communal offering and start dividing people. Saying, oh, you can do it in this way, you can't do it in that way, this and that. No. Once, tumah utra b'tzibor, utra, everybody can come. Amar Rav Chista. Rav Chista says, wait a minute. It's only if the sakin, okay, this means the majority of the knives, you need knives to slaughter the animals, the majority of the knives became impure in contact with a dead body. Remember that unique law about knives that came in contact with dead bodies or metals that came in contact with dead bodies? Remember it said, I'm reading the Pasuk from Bamidbar Yotet, Pasuk Tet Zayin. Anything that touches al panasa dead bechalal cherev, what this means literally is if you touch a dead body, okay, a dead body that was killed by the sword. Now, why did it tell you killed by the sword? So they learn, right, and then it says oba mate, oba etzam adam, or bekever, any of these things, yitmashi batirim, that's tumat The rabbis derive from there, we're going to read it inside now, cherev hareu kechalal. Because it says halal cherev, they say any sword that touches a dead body is going to have. And not just a sword, a knife, anything metal that touches a dead body is going to have the status of the dead body itself, which means that it can pass on to many people. Remember, Kaleem normally, right, or either a reshown usually, and they only pass on tuma to food and drink. They don't pass on tuma to it could become an ava tuma also, but it still would only pass on tuma to food and drink, certainly not to people. Okay, so if that's the case. What does he say? This is obviously only referring to a case when the knife became an avatuma itself, that it can pass on tuma even to people. Okay, why? Because kamitame legavra, because what will happen? People will come into the, let's say, right? In this case, all the people are Torim, except for, let's say, a few Tameim. We now say everyone can come into the temple, even the minority that are Tameim. Why? Because anyone who touches that knife, what's going to happen to them? They're going to become Tame also. So it doesn't matter if you're Tahor or Tameh, you're all going to become Tameh as soon as you go into the temple and start slaughtering. Because what's the issue here? If he hadn't, right, he would have become, this is a, the issue of a person coming in and doing the Pesach, Bitumah, is Isor Karet. In this case, what happens? We're obviously going to override Isor Karet here because otherwise no one's going to be able to do the Korban Pesach because as soon as they come into the temple, they're going to slaughter. They're going to become Tameh. Again, it might not be everybody. There'll be one every 10, let's say. They're all going to become Tameh. We allow them to do the Korban Pesach even though there's Isor Karet. So obviously it's all overridden here. But he says, Let's say there was a Sheretz in the temple and he jumped onto all the knives, Okay. Got them all tamay. Now that doesn't pass on impurity only to food and drink. So what will become tamay in this case? 
the meat will become tamay. And we'll have a case where the meat of all the karma Pesachs are going to be tamayim. Kamsha Christi says, in that case, we're not allowing people who are tamay to come in. Why? Because de basahu de metamiyala. Now, legavre lo metamiyala, but the people won't become tamay in this case. So if that's the case, to Horin Avi, we only allow pure people to come into the temple. Why? Tme'in lo avid and not impure because mutav ye'achel betuma basar belav. What's the isur of eating meat that's tame in the temple? It's just an isur lav. You don't get curried for it. So we're now going to allow only, we're overriding only an isur lav. We're not overriding an isur karit, like tame people doing the sacrifice. And therefore, va'al ye'achel basar betuma guf shu karit. We're not going to allow here tuma guf, which normally you get curried if you came into the temple and ate when you're impure. The meat, if you eat it when the meat's impure, that's only a lav. So therefore, that's what got overridden. But the kare didn't get overridden in this case, and therefore only people of Chorim can do it. So when it said the kle shalet or tzmeim, that was only, and then that allows everyone to do a betuma, it's only if it was from a halal chere, okay? Meaning it was in contact with the dead body, the, the, the kle shalet, and they became an avatuma. And then once we permit some people betuma, we'll permit everybody but not if it was something else. So now, what do you see from here? This is obvious. Now this goes back to a machlok that we talked about before. Tuma must be just pushed aside. It's not overridden entirely. If it were overridden entirely, it wouldn't make a difference. If it was once we allow the Pesach to be Tuma, we basically say all Tuma is swept aside, irrelevant. But we must be saying Tuma de Chuya, it's only... Again, maybe push aside wasn't the right word, right? It's entirely permitted, as opposed to saying tuma de chuya, which is it was just pushed aside, but it's still there. If it's still there, then we have to minimize. This is a classic question. I'll give you a relevant example to this. Also, two different approaches to understanding pikuach nefesh toches shabbat. Pikuach nefesh, right? You want to save someone, it overrides shabbat. There's a debate among the commentaries whether it overrides entirely, and you can do anything you want. You don't even have to think twice, or do we say, no, try to minimize what you're doing. Try to do Durabanans, try to do it with a chinoy. Remember all those halakha we learned, if you do it differently, kill in a different manner, then it's only Durabanan. Do we say that? Or do we say, no, it's entirely permitted. So it's, it's the same type of debate here about the tumor. Okay. That was Rav Chista. Rav disagrees. Rav Amar, afilu tmeim nami avde. Okay, even if you're tamay, even if the meat is tamay, or just the, you know, let's say the kelim were tamayim too much sheretz, we still allow everyone who's tamay that year to come in. Why? He learns it from a pasuk, tama dichtiv. Look at the pasuk. The pasuk that talks about both the eating of the meat that's tamay and a tamay person going into the temple, both appear in the same verse. Habasal asher yiga bechol tamay lo yeachel ba'eshi saref. Meat that gets in contact with something impure has to be burned, can't be eaten. Vahabasal and the meat that is pure, kol tahor yochabasal. Only pure people are allowed to eat sacrificial meat. So there you have in the Pasuk the same, both those issues. So what does he say? Kol hechad lo karina be vahabasar sheyiga b'chol tamei lo yachel. When we override the first part of the verse, like in our case, where we're going to allow people to eat the korban Pesach that became impure, Lo karina be, then we also allow the second part of the verse. And when the first part becomes overridden, so does the second, which is habasar kol tahor yochal basal. Anyone who's tahor can eat the meat. And therefore, in this year, we're going to allow anyone who's even tamay, because just like the meat one is overridden, also the, the tumara guf is overridden. And kol hecha de karina be, but when, this is just the reverse, when the pasuk is applicable, habasar sheyiga b'chol tamay lo yachel, then karina be vahabasar kol tahor yochal basal. So only when that's applicable is that one applicable, which means that in a year where we say all the meat became tame because all the knives had come in contact with a, with one of the creepy crawling creatures, which made it tame, and now all the meat's going to become tame. We're going to also allow all the people because as soon as the first part of the verse doesn't apply, also this one does. Now we're going to get to our 50-50 machloket here, and that's going to take us to the end of today's staff. Itma. Harei Israel So if they're 50% tolerin, 50% tmeim. What do we say? Rav Amar, mechza, mechza kerov. We view, okay, I was thinking about elections, right? That's what's the topic of discussion here in Israel now, right? It's classic, or in America recently, right? So, right, if it's 50 50, what do you do in elections, right? It's a classic question. How do you handle 50 50, right? So, this is the question. 
Rav says mechza mechza is like rov. You have half, that's like you have the majority. Okay, even though it's not exactly, but we treat it like majority. Rav Kahana Amar mechza mechza eno kirov. He says it's not like the majority. So now Rav Amar mechza mechza kirov. So what's the relevance? So what happened? Now he says it's going to happen though a little bit differently this year. What do we say in the in the Brayta? We said that if um, they're tmeim, right? What did we say that line? The whole, everyone does it, even Batuma together, no, no issue because ain't korban tzibor nechlak. But now he's going to say differently. So what happens? You, you split the mikdash. You have half the people do it b'tahara. They keep their tara because it's not exactly the same as a regular year because it's 50-50. So there's no full majority. So we're going to have you doing, it's like saying, oh, the presidential election, it was 50-50, we're going to have two presidents, right? So we're going to say, you rule over your group and you rule over your group, right? And that is all the tolling will go together and do their sacrifice, bitahara. It's not now like, oh, everyone can do a bituma. And all the tmeim do a bituma. So we have two, two tracks going on, right? Hard to imagine exactly how they would do this, but that's what they said. So therefore, what is he going to do? And as I said before, there's going to be two versions of what he says. This is the first version. Very simple. It's not majority. So therefore, you can get pushed off to Pesach Sheni, no problem. Anyone who's Tameh goes and does it next time. But some people say, But it's also not a mi'ut. It's not a rov. It's not a majority. It's not a minority. Remember, in order to Pesach Sheni, you have to be a minority. So he's, the second version is, to shon, the pure people do the first time. Utmeim, eino sin lo rishon v'lo But the impure people don't do Pesach Rishon and don't do Pesach Sheni because they're not a majority, but they're also not a minority. So they're stuck that year. They can't do Pesach at all. Okay. Now we're going to, so he's going to explain exactly this right now. They can't do the first because they're not a majority. And they can't do the second because they're not a minority. We're going to start with now. If you have, if you're using the sheet, we're going to right now. I did the sheet. I did a big chart. We're only going to get back to the chart after. So now we're going to the part under the chart. Tanan. We're now bringing a question on Rav from our Mishnah. Now this is going to be the classic inference from different parts of the Mishnah. So the Mishnah starts out. Nitma kahal orubo. Our Mishnah says, right, you do the whole thing betuma when the majority are are tmeim. Uh, so it seems to imply here, rubohu da'avde betuma. Only if there's a majority do you do a betuma. Aval palgu palga lo avde berishon. But it sounds like if it's 50 50, that seems to say only majority. Majority means anything above, right? If you, just like you would say with election. You don't have a majority unless you have 51%. 50% is not a majority. Right. So likewise here, when it's a majority, it meant majority. It didn't, even if you treat it like rub, it's not really a majority. So therefore, that would be difficult to rub. So Amar the Rav, Rav could explain like this. Ruba Avde Kulu Batuma. Our Mishnah was talking about when you have a real majority. When you have a real majority, what happens? That's what we said before. Everyone does a Batuma, right? Everyone can come in, all the Tmeim can come in and do it. But Palga upalga, but there's a difference with the 50-50 case, and that just wasn't mentioned in the Mishnah. That's why it's true. The Mishnah was trying to exclude our case because our case is a little bit different. You still do the Pesach Betuma, but halalu osin latzman, halalu osin latzman. There's a bit of a difference in our halacha here, Rav says, and that wasn't mentioned in the Mishnah. You have to wonder why didn't the Mishnah mention it, but okay, maybe the Mishnah was talking about most cases. It's very rare that you're going to have exactly 50-50. Hachinami mistabra, and you can further prove this reading because that inference you made from the Reisha, you can make the exact same inference from the last line of the Mishnah, the other direction. To Katani Seifa, the Seifa says, Nitma mi'uta kahal, So it sounds like only if it's the minority, which would seem to imply if it's 50-50, right? Just like majority excluded 50-50, also minority excludes the 50-50 case. So if we want to infer from the second part, mi'utu, what would you infer? You would say, Oh, mi'utu de'avid v'sheni, aval palgu palga lo. And then what would you do if not? Oh, you don't bring it in Pesach Sheni. What do you do then? He would say, ah, oh. it also wasn't mentioned. And what's the inference from here? Halalu wal sin You do it on Pesach Rishon and you do it 
you split, right? Half do it this way, half do it that way. In other words, the point is, if you want to derive something from the ratio and question me, well, I can derive my answer from the safe. So you can't work with these derivations, basically these um, inferences, because they contradict each other, right? So now they say, okay, wait. So the point is that the Mishnah just wasn't referring to this in-between case, which as I said before, you can explain because you could say it's such a rare case that they just didn't bother mentioning. So we now have, right? The Mishnah talks about if majority this way, minority that way, and our case is, falls right in the middle. And that's how Rav explains our Mishnah, just not mentioned. But now, according to the way we just explained it, we have a problem to Rav Kahana and Lakashya the Rav Kahana. Because Rav Kahana said, it's not, right? Again, it depends which lesson of Rav Kahana. So let's see. Amar Lecha Rav Kahana. Well, how would he explain our Mishnah? Because we said mi'ut means it excludes 50-50. Now he said either mi'ut does Pesach Sheini or mi'ut can't do Rishon and can't do Sheini. So how are we going to explain both those with the Mishnah? So again, nitmu'u. So Rav Kahana could answer again. Rav, Amar Lecha means he's not here to answer, but we're giving an answer in his name. Nitmu'u mi'uta kahal. If the minority of the people we, were Tamei, that's what the Mishnah says. Toli no simita rishonu tme'imus simita sheni. What would be the inference then? Ha palga palga, if it's 50 50, totally no simita rishonu, but tme'im, eno sim lo ata rishonu, lo ata sheni. That works perfectly for the second reading of Rav Kahana. It's exactly, it's not mentioned in our Mishnah because it's not the case. If that were to happen, what would you say? You can't even do Pesach Sheini 50-50. So that's a good answer. But that obviously only works. Hatinach, it only works. Elishna Batra to Rav Kahana, the second version. But the first version of Rav Kahana, El Elahach Lishna to Amar Rav Kahana, according to the first version of Rav Kahana, what did he say? The, the Tehoim do Pesach Rishon and the Tmeim do Pesach Sheini, which is exactly the case in our Mishnah. But the Mishnah called that a Miyud, it didn't say 50-50. So how are we going to explain that? So how can we explain this? Sorry, even 50-50 would be the same as the last case in our Mishnah. Okay, whoever's pure does Pesach Rishon, whoever's not does Pesach Sheni. So then, so why did it say minority? Oh, that's just linguistically. Why'd they do it? A literary thing. I did Tani Resha Rubo, Tani Nami Sefa Miuto. The beginning of the Mishra said the majority, because that's really only in the majority. So the second part said minority, even though it really means 50 50. Okay, that's a common answer given in the Mishnah that don't get too hung up on a word because it could just be there for literary purposes. Now, what we're going to do is the rest of the structure is very simple. And now it goes back to the chart, which is we're going to bring a bright to support each reading which basically shows, the Gemara didn't exactly read it this way, but it basically shows that the same debate that they were having, Rav and Rav Kahana, was also a debate in the time of the Tanaim. That's basically what it shows. That these debates existed then too. So let's just start with that and then we'll see what the Gemara does with it. So Tanya Kavate de Rav, Tanya Kavate de Rav Kahana, Ketre Lishne. We're going to have a bright to the support Rav, and we're going to have Brito to support both readings of Rav Kahana. This part's going to be very simple because we're just going to read Tanaitic sources that say exactly what Rav and Rav Kahana said according to all the readings. So one by one, the first one, Tanya Kavate de Rav. Hayu Yisrael mechzit orim umechzit meim was 50-50. Halal osin latzman, halal osin latzman. Each one does their own separately. Tanya Kalish Nekama de Rav Kahana, like the first Lashon of Rav Kahana. Haresh Hayu Yisrael mechzit orim umechzit meim, again 50-50. Torim osim et harishon, utmeim osim et hashini. Right, the Torim do Pesach Rishon, the Tzmeim do Pesach Sheni. That's Rav Kahana, the second one. Le, third bright, Tanya Kalish Nebatar de Rav Kahana. Shaharesh Ayu Yisrael Mechze Torim Umechze Tzmeim. Torim Osim Et Harishon, Tzmeim Osim Ena Mosim Lo Et Harishon Belo Et Hashini. There's a bright to support the third reading of Rav Kahana. Now, what the Gemara is going to do is instead of saying, "Oh, I guess this was a Machloka Tanaim," the Gemara is going to try to explain each source according to the other two and have some sort of creative reading of each source till the last one where they don't have a choice, but otherwise they're gonna to try to come up with ways to read this. So, So that's why it's easy when you look at the chart to Rav and the last Lashon of Rav Kahana, how did they explain Haditana, the one that supports the middle reading, how are they gonna say, what case would they think that the to the the, to me, the to him, to Pesach Rishon and the im get pushed off. So Kigon Shayu Israel Mechzet Torin U Mechzet Tmeim. 
So now the case is, is a very interesting case. We're now going to bring women into the picture. Why? Because there's a debate whether women are chayev. Possibly they're not even chayev in Pesach Rishon of Korban Pesach. And even if they are, some people say they're not chayev in Pesach Sheni. We're going to get to all this later, so I'm not going to go in depth into this right now, but it's going to come from the next few pages. So if they were mechzatori and mechzatmein, the men were 50-50. But the women made it more than 50-50. So it became majority Tmeim in Pesach Rishon. So, Kasavar, Nashim Barishon Rishut. Ah, but they held that women don't have to do Pesach, which means they're not counted. This is a fascinating question, right? Do they get counted then? So they're not counted in the count, which means, Dal Nashim Mitmeim, Bahavalu Tmeim Miuta. Now, what happens if you get rid of the women who are Tmeim, you end up with a minority of Tmeim. Okay, Okay, so then they get pushed off to Pesach Sheni. Okay, now we have to do the one that matched the Lishna Batra of Rav Kahana, who said you don't do it, not Pesach Rishon, and not even Pesach Sheni, what's going to be the case? So according to Rav and, and Rav Kahana, how are they going to explain? So how are they going to read that source? So each one's going to have to explain it differently. Rav mitaritz la kigon shay Yisrael mechzet meim u mechzet teorim. So again, the men were 50-50. Vin nashim odfot ala teorim. The women made them teorim. It turned out that more were going to be teorim because when you add the women, they were teorim. Now, according to this reading, v'kasavar nashim b'rishon chovah b'sheni v'shut. Women are obligated in Korban Pesach. So in Korban Pesach rishon, there was a majority of teorim. So they didn't do it because, right, Pesach isn't betuma then. Now, again, we're trying to find a case where they can't do Pesach Rishon and they can't do Pesach Sheni. So now, obviously, what's going to happen? Birishon lo avde, dahave le miut. Umiuta lo avde birishon. So that's why we didn't do it. It was a minority. But bisheni lo avde, because dan the shiminayu. Women aren't obligated in Pesach Sheni, which means that they leave the count in Pesach Sheni. Now you're going to have majority tmeim. Majority or tmeim in Pesach Sheni. Remember, you can't do Pesach Sheni as a majority. So therefore, Havali Palgo Palga, right? They're going to be 50-50 actually without the women. And Palga lo avde b'sheni, right? Remember, Rav, this is all Rav. Rav holds a minority, 50-50 uh, is a majority. According to him, there's a majority now. They can't do it. Ula Rav Kahana, da'amar palga nami avde b'sheni, hechem itaritzla. According to him, you could do 50-50 is a, is a minority. So according to him, you should be able to do it. So why not? So he has to explain it a little differently. Kigon shayu Yisrael. If you took everybody together, it was exactly 50-50. But But there's more women to holim. So when you take out the women, your 50-50 percentage moves up. The men were more to, more impure than the women were. So now you're going to end up with a majority, and a real majority, not a 50-50, a real majority in Pesach Sheni when you remove the women. And therefore, in the Rishon, since the women are counted, it was exactly 50-50. Upalga Barishon lo avde, and you don't do it 50-50 according to Rav Kahana. Ubesheni nami lo avde, because dal nashim minayu mina torim. Since the women were the majority on the on the torim side, you have to take off all the you know the women. Havalut meim ruba that tilts the balance. The majority are impure because now the men were only looking at men, and the majority of the men were impure. Uruba lo avde besheni. Okay, so you end up with these crazy cases. Right to explain how to read the brayta that way. Last thing, and this is much simpler. Lirav kahana haditanya haresha yisrael mechtet torin umechtet tzvim halalu osin latzman balalu osin latzman hechem itaritzla. That one is really going to be difficult because Rav Kahana didn't think there's ever a case where half do it it betuma and half do it betara because he thinks fifty fifty is not a majority. So he's not going to view it that way. So how can he explain it? So Amar lecha Rav Kahana tonight he's going to have to say that's a machloket tanaim. It's a machloket anaim. I just don't hold by that brayta. That brayta holds mechza al mechza is rov, and that's why you do it v'tumah. And I hold not, and my I have other brayta to support my reading, so I can do that again. Question: Why didn't the Why didn't the Gemara say that? Right, the Gemara could have said that for all the answers, but I think that when the Gemara has an option of explaining it some other way. They'd rather fit the bright toad into everybody rather than saying this was a big machloket in the time of the Tanaim. Okay, however, in the end, one of the sources for sure indicates that there was definitely, at least according to Rav Kahana, there's only one way to explain it is that it's a machloket Tanaim. Okay, well, and here, have a great day, everybody.